Number six, is there a difference between assault and battery? These two terms are often used together in criminal cases, so much so that most people tend to think that they're actually interchangeable. However, there is a difference between the legal definitions of assault and battery, and it's actually a little counterintuitive. In non-legal terms, assault is used to mean an attack on someone. War stories often talk about full frontal assaults, and it usually means something quite violent and bloody. But as a legal term, assault actually means the attempt and the ability to cause harm to someone. This can include physical acts or even just threatening language. It's a promise to do bodily harm that the aggressor is actually physically able to inflict, but you can be charged with assault just for yelling at someone without ever actually laying a finger on them. Battery is the act of violence itself, defined as the willful use of force or violence on another person. The two terms are usually used together because acts of violence are often accompanied or preceded by threatening acts or words, although not always. In other words, assault is telling someone you're going to beat them up. Battery is beating them up. Assault and battery is threatening to beat someone up and then beating them up. Now you think if it was proven in court that you would actually beat someone up, that's worse than just threatening to beat someone up, so you should really only be charged with battery, the worst crime. However, prosecutors will usually push for charges of assault and battery because as two separate charges, it's likely to result in a longer conviction. Sort of a twofer, if you will. Number seven, speaking of batteries, why do battery sizes go AAA, AA, C, and D instead of A, B, C, D? Well, actually, they used to. Originally, battery and electronics manufacturers used to make batteries in proprietary sizes and called them by whatever names they wanted to. After World War I, the United States Department of War got together with industry representatives and standardized the sizes and voltages of batteries to be used for commercial and industrial purposes. They then decided to use an alphabetic naming convention to go with the new standardized battery sizes, which went A, B, C, D. There were a few exceptions, but they were relatively unimportant. Now over time, as consumer electronics got more compact and as battery technology improved, smaller batteries were not only possible, but they were needed. So when two new batteries were introduced that were smaller than A, they were designated as AA and AAA. Over time, C and D batteries remained widespread, although fewer and fewer devices needed the old A or B size batteries, and so they gradually disappeared. Well, not completely. A and B batteries are still made, they're just not used for much, only very specific devices that aren't used by the general public very often. I think A type batteries are used in some like hobby type battery packs, and B type batteries are used in certain types of camping lanterns, but that's about it. Number eight, why do academic grades go A, B, C, D, F and skip over E? Okay, this is a quick one. The simple answer is that the scale actually did go A, B, C, D, and E when it was first introduced back in 1897. However, most people thought it was counterintuitive that E stood for failing instead of for excellent. At that time, A, B, C, and D were considered passing grades. I don't know about you, but that sure wasn't the case at any school I've ever been to. D was always a failing grade for us, but, you know, no pressure. A was the highest passing grade, and D was the lowest passing grade, so it made sense that those went in a descending order. But since the failing grade was, for all intents and purposes, a separate category altogether, it could really be anything that anyone wanted it to be. Although F is probably the one we're most familiar with, some schools don't use F at all. They might use U for unsatisfactory or N for needs improvement. And believe it or not, some schools do actually still use E as their failing grade. And some schools don't use a letter system at all. It's really all arbitrary. Number nine, why don't they board airplanes from the back? If you've had to travel by plane any time in the last two decades, you've probably finally had your zone called, only to have to stand in the boarding bridge for what seems like hours, creeping forward inch by inch until you're finally on the plane, only to see a milling horde of idiots standing in the aisles while other idiots take their sweet time trying to put their carry-ons up in the overhead bins. 
and these are the idiots who are in the front and middle rows, blocking the aisles for people who are trying to get to their seats further in the back of the plane. Why, you may ask, don't they let the people with seats in the back get on first so they're not being blocked by everyone else? And it seems to make sense, but there are a few reasons why they don't do it that way. Notice I don't say a few good reasons, because they're not all good reasons, but what are you gonna do? First off, some planes, like the Boeing 737 and the Airbus 319 and 320, are naturally tail-heavy because of their structural design. If bags and cargo have been loaded in the rear cargo bins, and then on top of that you start packing passengers into the rear of the plane, it could cause the plane to tip backwards. Not a good situation. Second, the turnaround time for most flights is extremely short. When the plane pulls into the gate, the passengers get off and bags and cargo are unloaded. Meanwhile, the cabin has to be cleaned, the plane refueled, the lavatories emptied, the entire aircraft inspected for safety, and the new bags and cargo loaded. It's a lot of work to do in a very short amount of time, and frankly, if the passenger boarding process was super efficient, it means that instead of sitting in the nice air-conditioned terminal, passengers would end up spending more time in their cramped seat on the plane before the crew is even able to turn on the AC or start serving drinks. The airlines are concerned that their satisfaction ratings would drop if their passengers were subjected to that, so they deliberately slow down and break up the boarding process so that their passengers don't have to spend quite so much time on the actual plane. Third, simple back-to-front actually isn't the most efficient way to board the plane. Anyone who's actually worked for an airline could have told you this. Although it didn't start to become common knowledge until it was proven on an episode of Mythbusters. They found that the actual fastest way to board the plane was a free-for-all approach with no assigned seating. Just let everyone go full-on Thunderdome inside. <laughs> However, even though it's the fastest, it actually results in lower customer satisfaction. For some reason, people tend to get a little stressed out when they don't have a guaranteed seat assignment, especially if they're traveling with others and want to make sure that they're all seated together. If you're a family of four and you end up in the back of the line to board the plane, congratulations, you're all getting middle seats and all in different rows. So, the second fastest way, or in other words, the fastest way to board a plane while still retaining seat assignments, is to board the window seats first, then the middle, then the aisle. So ideally, you would board all of the window seats back to front, then the middle seats back to front, and finally the aisle seats back to front. But that starts to get a little complicated, and the effort of sorting passengers so stringently would eat up all of the time you would save during boarding, and then some. So the next time you're flying on an airline with assigned seating, relax. Your seat is safe. Don't immediately leap up and get in the line to board the plane. The only thing you're missing out on is that overhead bin space tends to fill up quickly. And that's a whole other rant in itself. But you can try to avoid that headache altogether by packing smart and putting everything into a personal item, like a backpack, that you can squish under the seat in front of you. Pro tip. Number 10. And finally, what do the Q and Q-tips and the KY and KY jelly stand for? Okay, apparently I didn't plan this very well because we're ending on the dumbest ones, but at least these are quick. The Q and Q-tip stands for quality. Kind of typical corporate speak. If you're interested in additional Q-tip trivia, they were additionally marketed as Baby Gays from 1923 to 1926 before the name was changed to Q-tips. Also, the generic name for Q-tips in America is cotton swabs, but in other countries, such as India, they're referred to as earbuds. Now this has caused a bit of confusion in my house when my wife, who is from India, asked me to hand her some earbuds after her shower, and I show up with these. The KY and KY jelly is both easier to answer and also a little harder. Now according to the manufacturer, the KY doesn't actually stand for anything. They were just random letters that were arbitrarily assigned to that formula. 
KY Jelly was first invented by a smaller company called Van Horn and Sautel in the early 1900s, and the prevailing theory is that as their R&D team came up with new formulas, they kept track of them using two letters instead of numbers, and the formula that worked the best as a personal lubricant just happened to be formula K-Y. Sorry, that was kind of anticlimactic. Okay, I hope these were enlightening. Some of these were questions I asked as a kid, uh, some are ones that occurred to me as I got a little older, some are ones that I never bothered to ask, but the one thing that they had in common was that none of these answers were ever just given to me. I had to go digging, because for some reason the answers aren't exactly common knowledge. Of course, none of these are terribly important to our daily lives, but I think it's always better to know than to not know. Now, if you have very young kids, I'm sure you're going to be asked at least two of these questions over the next couple of years, if you haven't already, and now at least you'll know the answers. Don't worry, you don't have to tell them where you heard it. If you want to elaborate on or even correct any of the answers that I've given in this video, you're welcome to do so politely in the comments. If you want to hurl insults and unfounded accusations at me because you didn't agree with the answers I've given, you're welcome to go and f*** yourself. Please let me know that you like this video by hitting the like button, and let me know that you like this channel by subscribing. Thank you very much, and we'll see you next time.